so very good evening and uh, for the previous lectures some of you were uh, looking at your mobile phone but for the subsequent session you can't do that because we are all going to do a voting pad and for each question you have to vote and your name will not come there anyway there is no negative mark so please vote some answer uh, if you vote i mean if you answer something and if it is going to be right one you won't forget right if you answer something if that is wrong and we will give the correct answer again you won't forget the answering is important so can i request uh, that narayan nambudri and dr patil to come in to the set uh to introduce uh, them they are great health officials of the country uh, the one common connection between the two is that both are from all indian institute of medical sciences no he did his the connection i said the connection is both have been connected through all indian institute of medical sciences okay and connection between dr narayan nambudri and myself is i also related to sri chitra i did my dmg and the connection between kapil and myself is more, both the names are starting with k okay so we have some connection here so we can go to the issue just now yeah presentation is ready uh, the voting card system is ready the all the remotes what you are carrying no? you uh, click on the remote towards this session because the sensor is there and the options are like a b c d suppose you have wrongly clicked d and actually you wanted to change your answer to d you can keep for the second time within this uh, within that 15 uh, countdown whichever you click the last will be taken by the computer okay so you all got it so you go to the quiz now so yeah okay uh, a 17 year old girl with rheumatic heart disease was uh, Correct answer. Majority got the uh, correct answer. Seventy percent have got it right. It's a uh, drug box. It's the Dakangiri one. Enter one. I think it is more of a pattern recognition. Clearly shows bi-directional endocardial tachycardia. You have multiple causes. I mean, myocardial is can be due to cause. The oxygen toxicity can be due to cause. The peripheral hemorrhage. Classically seen in CPU too also. So, uh, but you have a clinical condition where the patient with rheumatic heart disease coming with a upper sensory and say it is 4.7. This is not expected due to CPU too. What do you see during the surgery? Here it is clearly positive. Another important point is that when a patient comes with the digoxin toxicity, the commonest predisposing condition in our country is actually rheumatoid. Patient has been stable on the medication, and suddenly patient has got due to some reason the uh, renal dysfunction, and the the digoxin levels drop. It has got a narrow therapeutic window. Digoxin toxicity is the reason. Good. Next, please. Okay. Uh, Next slide. Yeah. This is the 16-year-old girl with recurrent palpitations. So, what is the diagnosis? Time for it. So 
that you said uh, confusion. <laughs> okay, anyway, uh, Dr. Kapil will discuss. Okay, so, EVRT, AVNRT actually is more of a different physiological because the FPT most of the time the treatment will be on the correct lines. But uh, look at the lead V1, if you may. There is a R prime kind of thing after the QRS. And that gives a clue that uh, this may be the retrograde P wave, which is seen there. And it is very near the QRS. So it's very, very short RP, which is possible only in AV and RT. In AV, RT, the P wave retrograde has to travel a little longer duration in the ventricle. I mean, the retrograde impulse has to travel a little longer. And that's why the P wave is usually away from the QRS and it doesn't appear to merge with the QRS. So, so that uh, pseudo R prime kind of pattern is not usually seen. So this is SVT with AV and RT and not the AVR. Yeah, so V1 we look for R prime and uh, like in release we can have the pseudo S, yes, uh, which is not S yes, again. Actually, you, you can confirm it only once the tachycardia is terminated or if you have a previous ECG, because similar appearances can sometimes be pretty deceptive in certain patients. Exactly. If you have a similarly after post uh, conversion, if you have a sinus rhythm, and the sinus rhythm ECG, if you don't have the so called pseudo yes. Then you can confirm, you can almost see the behavior. Next case. Five year old child referred for irregular work. What's the diagram? Time. So most of the uh, one common indication why the pediatricians refer us is the irregular heart. The most common irregular heart rate is a sign of it. The one simple way to reassure the pediatrician is that you know if he calls you your phone, make the child to sit up, uh, do a sit up for some five minutes or so, sorry, five times. The heart rate will increase and will become normal. So this will not be diagnosed. You know, sometimes if the guru gives him. People have a tendency to die in the guilty cause. There is no P which is not connected. It's like a group beating, but there is no P which is not connected. So it's a simple sign. Can you make a comment? Yes, in fact, it comes in groups. The previous That's right, it comes yeah. in groups. Yeah. So That's why, based on the group system alone, you should not diagnose. Yeah, you see, if it happens every three seconds or so, generally it is respiratory phasic. The respiratory phasic, very end of sinus surgery. It comes after four or five days. Right. Thank you. So again, 15 year old boy had sudden freeze in foot. He was taken to the nearby hospital where the politician continued for another half an hour. Assess the ECG and give the best treatment. Time up. Majority of that. So I would like to comment uh, on this choice A. So amiodrome seems to be the, the panacea for everything in the arrhythmia which you don't understand. This is the thing which actually creates problems at times. Not uh, just IV amiodrome, oral amiodrome is also heavily abused by cardiologists and pediatric cardiologists all, and by physicians as well. So this is. Uh, Got QRS most of the times. The more important feature is to look in this rhythm strip is or in this strip is that everything is irregular. Most of the VTs are supposed to be regular, so there can be VTs which can be regular, especially polymorphic VT. But here you see clearly that there are intermittently narrow QRS uh, QRS uh, seen in between, which can be confused with a capture beat of a VT as well. But the irregularity part is the giveaway thing that it is an atrial fibrillation thing. And now that uh, multiple broad QRSs are there with variable QRS morphology points to it being atrial fibrillation association with an accessory pathway. And that is a pre-excited AF, the diagnosis. In that case, if you give IV amiodrome, you actually initially will be blocking the AV node further. 
and all the impulses will then trend to travel through the accessory pathway and can actually initiate a VF. So IV amutron in this case can actually be more catastrophic than actually helpful. So this condition, the first instance you should go for DC cardioversion because that is the thing which uh, can save the patient from catastrophe. So answer is C, like most of them right. So whenever you have an irregularly irregular pathway, the first diagnosis is atrial fibrillation. Whether the QRS is narrow or broad, irrespective of the QRS, irregularly irregular heart rate, the first diagnosis is Then only you should think about that. Okay, next question, please. So 10 year old child present with tachycardia. What is the best treatment for this tachycardia? Excellent uh, ECG. And there is a very, very important clue regarding which yes, Dr. Kapila has already told in the previous session. Okay, time up. Okay. So Again, uh, good that the majority have got it correct, uh, but I can see the confusion. So it's a broad QRS tachycardia, relatively broad QRS. It's still pretty narrow for a VT uh, in most of the uh, sort of mental this thing. But if you look carefully, there are two things which uh, can you remove the answer? Uh, can you remove the answer? So there are two things which uh, point it to be a VT rather than an SVT. One is uh, here, there was a capture beat. Yeah, uh, you can see on the top uh, is also, it's narrower than the rest of the ECG. And secondly, you can go back. back. Previous. Previous. And you can see P waves intermittently. For example, in this complex, there is a P wave, which makes, and it is not there in other uh, places in the before QRSS, so there is a AV dissociation. Yeah, you can see this P wave also, so at many places you can make out P waves, which are not there consistently. So there is an AV dissociation, there are capture beats, so it makes it an ECG diagnosis of VT. Now, in a structurally normal heart, you do see VTs like this. And one of the commoner ones is what we call as left posterior fascicular VT, or earlier it was called as IL VT also. And these are verapamil sensitive VTs, and that is why IV verapamil is the correct answer for this. So this is a fascicular VT in a structurally normal heart, uh, also called as IL VT early. Actually, incidentally, both of you had given the same. Uh, you had mentioned oral verapamil, and yes, mentioned. <laughs> Next one. See, there is right bundle joint. Ten-year-old girl presented with tachycardia. Previous. Okay, next. So, a known case of ASD. Comment on the suitability of uh, waves portion. Timer. Relatively good numbers. And uh, C, many have selected C, they may not be wrong, but B is definitely correct. And medicine, you know, there is no 100%. That's why we have put as probable. Uh, the, it is sinus rhythm. There is RS, RS, RS pattern in V1, and we have written the known case of AC. But the QRS axis is left axis. Left here, isn't it? That usual uh, sinus venous is sorry. Usual arch and second and AC should have a normal axis. Sometimes right load axis, but left load axis is very unusual. Presence of left load axis makes it the probable diagnosis of sinus. 
So because the problem prime on ESP, we can straight away cancel the pair with the probability one to the one. On the clockwise loop and also there one and the median median has a bit QA and PR also is 200. Indian so ASP is the possibility. Okay. Correct. Next please. Again, the Kapil side is saying to use this for some reason. Uh, ten year old child found to have bradycardia during an episode of typhoid. This was the ECG. Now, these are the options. Time of this. <laughs> I think those who chose B and C have made the diagnosis right, but uh, the decision subsequent to the diagnosis was quite different. But those who chose A, they have not uh, made the diagnosis right. Yes, sir. So this is a contentious issue from the beginning, but the diagnosis is no, no, not a problem. Uh, it is not sinus rhythm. I mean, it is sinus rhythm, but there is something more to it. Uh, we call sinus rhythm for the P waves. But there is no correlation between the P wave and the QR. So there is a complete AV dissociation. And this is possible in complete heart block only. The QRS is narrow, so it makes it to be a congenital complete heart block, a more likely diagnosis. So you can have acquired uh, uh, AV blocks also with narrow QRS escape rhythms, but more likely in this kind of history, it could be congenital complete heart block. And this alone would not warrant you straight away to go for a pacemaker. You have to decide other things before giving a pacemaker. In one of the recent long-term studies where they followed pacemakers throughout 20, 25 years, almost 16% of the patients have had serious complications related to the pacemaker. So pay, giving a pacemaker is like giving another disease to a person. If it does not what? deserve it, uh, you should be very careful in doing that. There are laid down criteria, some of which may be debatable. This is a pretty healthy heart rate. I think we changed it for the rate purpose, I believe. And uh, a patient otherwise has been happy, okay, because there is no previous history given in this clinical instance. Uh, if the patient is asymptomatic, you need to assess for whether the LV function is okay, whether LV size is okay, and whether there is a good chronotropic response on exercise. And that is why uh, answer B is probably more correct. I say probably more correct because there is no definitiveness in medicine, so uh, that is the answer. But A, no, uh, typhoid, sinus, bradycardia, this is not there. Fortunately, sir, just one more comment. Nobody has picked D, which is I'm pretty happy to see <laughs> because orciprinaline is again a drug which has been overused for no reason. It is oral orciprinaline does not reach blood at all. Or see best or other things which are used does not reach blood at all. The liver kills everything which you give orciprinaline in, uh, and there is nothing, no systemic circulation of orciprinaline at all. So, we yeah. thankfully nobody has. Uh, I used to say that orciprinaline is the placebo for the patient and for the doctor. Doctor feels that he is treating, the patient feels that he is getting the treatment. The only person who is benefiting is the company who is producing it. Yes, ma'am. So the thing is, it was an incidentally directed complete heart block. Not the child has come with. We have children coming with a failure. We have children coming with LV dilatation dysfunction. We have children coming with symptoms. There, there is no question of a TMT, straight away pacemaker. Here, it was an incidentally directed complete heart block. And even during the time of fever, child has powerful. So once the acute illness is over, it's a bit on TMT. Many a time, the heart rate, you won't believe, will go up to more than even 100. That means for reasonable chronotropic responses, the people who remain asymptomatical are only yes. They need to be under follow. They should not be told that you don't need pacemaker. You, you should say you don't need pacemaker at present. Please go back and come up for six months or one year. You should be under a, a regular follow up and you need to Unlike an accurate complete heart block, here the intention is to delay the pacing as late as possible, maybe 12 years or later. 
you can always do the procedure with the bail chamber procedure. Now, even conduction system basin is available. That should probably change the guidelines a bit. Always look for compelling indications if there is any. Otherwise, the spacing in child will be right from the operation. Most of the time, we do it in the army, and you can have an army dysfunction for it. And it will be different. So, this is the young adults. Which of the following mode of pacing is not possible? It will be easy only. Option. All I said is not possible. I said not possible. No? We have said not possible. Okay, what is this pacing? What do we see here? Atrial pacing or ventricular pacing or both? All of you agree that it's atrial pacing and the pace neck specs are quite big. Generally, we don't see this big. So, probably unicular pacing. And we have seen atrial pacing, right? Do we see ventricular pacing? Do we see ventricular pacing here? No, we don't see. All are conducted. Pace. Conducted PR. So, there is atrial pacing and ventricular conduction is there. So this can happen in the first of all. This patient has six sinus syndrome. You put an A pacemaker, only one lead in atrium. This can happen. Same thing the A A O O mode C. Okay, where there is no uh, kind of you know like uh, uh, uninhibited pacing from you. Can this be DVD pacing? Very much. Because when you lead is sensing that you are keeping quiet, but the atrial lead is pacing. So. Option A, B, C are possible. What is D? Is it a single lead tracing system or dual lead tracing system? DDD is a single lead tracing system. The lead is there in the ATM, which has a sensor. And the lead is only based in the ventricle. So can we sense the ventricle? ATM cannot paste the ATM in the VDD mode. Currently, I don't think it's available at all. I think most of the companies have stopped it. Because we have kind of six everyone to uh, dual chamber. So the answer which is not possible is BD. I, I think you are all kind of you know uh, clear about what I'm, I was trying to say. Any answer to DDD? Three of them. Mm -hmm. Actually, DDD, the thing is that if you have a intrinsic AV node conduction and the ventricle gets activated before the pace AV delay, in, it might have been kept at 200 milliseconds or two, the pace to PR interval is shorter than that. So, ventricle will tend to So, that is why DDD is still possible in this case. Yes. Suppose somebody is living in a sinus with an ECG and says he is having a pacemaker and if it's uh, in the mode of DDD, is it possible or not? Very much possible. Isn't it? So only when there is a need, both ATM and ventricle are being sensed and pacing is only in this. Next question. Okay, so again, uh, repetition of same his thing, same similar looking ECG. Very good. So this is good. Everybody got it. So this is atrial flutter. Those who have not got it, maybe looking at V1, you may still think that this is a pseudo yeah, uh, prime like kind sinus. of thing. And, uh, but it is not because there is another P wave after that. So there are two P waves or two flutter waves rather for one QRS. And if you look at uh, inferior leads, that is lead two and three, it does send type, type of give you a sawtooth appearance which is uh, there because of the usually typical atrial flutter. Since everybody got it, right. it is possible. If you want to ask something, that's not it? Yeah, and cardiomyopathy. You usually not expect uh, SVTs to cause cardiomyopathy, but uh, not a 100% proof statement, but flutters are more likely to cause cardiomyopathy. In children, SVTs do come with yes. cardiomyopathy, more commonly than others. In adults, uh, um, it will filter fibrillation itself will cause cardiomyopathy. We have seen many. In children, we do see simple SFL SVT can cause cardiomyopathy. It could be a curve chicken. Sometimes dilated cardiomyopathy can present with the can, yeah, DCM can present with the uh, 
get your plus one or get your plus one can lead on to second cardiomyopathy. So you have to control cardio and give one year bonus something. And keep the patient in sinus rhythm for a period of three to six months and evaluate. That's the best way. This one, uh, six months old. Isn't that with cardiac failure? Not since six months old, it's only with heart failure. The most likely diagnosis is the rhythm state. Time out. So now you answer. Now you answer. Perfect. I think uh, they also they are taught in uh, but still this is the right answer. He will explain why. If you to simply say tachycardia syndrome, it is bad for the very tachycardia syndrome. Tachycardia syndrome, yes, right. But when you label tachycardia syndrome, it's not uh, this kind of result. When you say tachycardia syndrome, you refer in the context of sinus node dysfunction with atrial fibrillation. Is it sinus node dysfunction with atrial fibrillation? Yes, it looks like. Yes, it does not. This is a very interesting. PG. You know, it's, uh, I mean, the answer is PGRT. It's a permanent or a persistent form of junction or reciprocate in tachycardia. In fact, it is also known as Kuhlman's tachycardia. Young age, it is young age. We see a lot of the preference with a lot of patients less than one year with this problem. And even I had cases referred otherwise for transplant. We ablated double oil show and case in my talk. Uh, need for a pediatric electrophysiologist. So uh, here, what you can see, there are two types of P waves, as you can see. This is the first P wave in lead to is positive. So we have every reason to believe it is a sinus leak. And at the end, you can see an inverted P wave. There it terminates. So any tachycardia that initiates with a sinus leak, you should suspect PJRT. Because it is a re-entrant circuit. You have a long re-entrant circuit, which any lead coming down can find this in the non-refractive state in the atrium, retrograde, because it is slowly conducting pathway. So it perpetuates the tachycardia. It terminates with the P wave again. Generally, atrial tachycardia will not terminate with a one-to-one -one relation tachycardia. Atrial tachycardia will not terminate. A plateau can terminate, but two-to-one and all. But atrial tachycardia, if it terminates, that means atrial tachycardia terminates. That focus terminates. In AV node is also blocked. Two concurrent events, unrelated happening together is generally not possible unless it is related to vagotonia or adenosine or in a two-to-one relationship tachycardia, atrial plateau. So it also you can see a re entrant bead here. This comes down through the AV node and goes back and causes an inverted peak. So here you have got a tachycardia which initiates with sinus peak, narrow complex, one to one VA relationship, or V2 QRS relationship, inverted in the inferior leads, echo beads. That means the pathway is atrium is getting activated from junction above and terminates with the PV and long pauses. The initial description of Komen is actually as a tachybrady syndrome, 100 years back. So this is a classical case of PJRT. What is the treatment? You said it. Why is it? <laughs> Heart probation. Um, see, when we uh, interrogate an aracurus tachybrady, we use the term long tachybrady, short tachybrady. So it's a long tachybrady, isn't it? The uh, RT is long. Long RT, and you have a inverted P wave before each year. So we tend to diagnose ectopic atrial tachycardia, correct? Okay, ectopic atrial tachycardia have two constellations between the buckets, but the way it is behaving, you know, uh, it comes for two seconds, goes off again, lasts for two seconds, a minute, and goes off. This is quite characteristic of PJRT. Usual ectopic atrial tachycardia, they will be on continuously, and if you kind of terminate, they will remain terminated for long. In a single volter, uh, we don't see this kind of batches of tachycardia, batches of magnetism. And other features, whatever that you are know, described, makes it as a kind of PGRT the first choice. Though atrial tachycardia has been given as a third choice, the, the BD or the concession should have been between B and C. Okay? And between B and C, which one you should choose here is B for all the reasons that are Thank you. Next one. Nothing good. Uh, 16 year old boy who was otherwise 20 at short years in the previous 60 years. During 
same value in the front end closure left side. That's what I mean. It's corollary to the previous ECG yeah. which we have. <laughs> Mostly, so most of you got it correct. It's a second degree part one. Blanky batch phenomena clearly batch QRS, QRS and uh, groups repeating. And uh, if you look carefully, you can see PR getting prolonged with each beat, and then the one of the P waves not protecting. So that's just classical Blanky batch. It's pretty common phenomena in young people. Not pretty common, but it's not unusual to find it in young people with high vagal tone because it's the effect of the vagus nerve on the AV node which leads to this kind of thing. And you see this more commonly when the persons are sleeping. So in Holter you can find these, uh, this phenomena in uh, young people very often. So it's not very uncommon. It does not require any further action. Uh, no pacemaker required at least. No orciprin. No orciprin. No orciprin. <laughs> okay, thank you. Next question. Eighteen-year-old male, a case of MEN alpha, multiple endocrine neoplasia type one. What is the likely endocrine anomaly responsible for the ECG? Very straight question. Uh, Yes, sir. Answer me. Everybody. Thank you. It's very easy for everyone. So, it's primarily the ECG abnormalities. Uh, if the uh, weight is low, minus it's around the, uh, 60, say 50 pounds. And also the QT is shorter. A small JV probably you can say. It's also good. So, short QT with the. In fact, uh, mm, this is MEN type 1, is associated with dilate set tumor type 1, DA tumors, so hyperparathyroid. So it's not a common picture, but also can have a uh, prolactin of epithelial tumors. So, uh, what is the diagnosis? <laughs> Anything more? So, basically, hyperkalemia. Hypercalcemia. Hypercalcemia. Uh, yeah, in fact, uh, the second consensus that 2003 Brugada. Consensus itself we had put it as a Brugada phenocopies. What can mimic a Brugada sign, type 1 Brugada pattern? Two electrolyte abnormality that can cause a JV, one is hypercalcemia, another is rarely hypokalemia. So the hypokalemia generally comes with a flat ST and a low amplitude TV. Both of them are considered as phenocopies. So it is actually a can sometimes mimic a Brugada pattern also. Here it is also can mimic a short QT syndrome. Again, a potassium channel mutation, KCM H2 and KCM T1. But here the question is framed in such a way that the diagnosis type of thing. Thank you. Next question. Had cardiac arrest. Had cardiac arrest during attempted TDA delivery. Three year old child had cardiac arrest during attempted TDA delivery. Perfect. Again, mostly uh, we have got the uh, right answer. I think everyone answered again, 69% is a huge majority. 
So the answer is very clear. You have got a G wave heterogeneity, repolarization heterogeneity. Transmural dispersion of repolarization is evident by a prolonged QT. And even within the repolarization, you have heterogeneity from B to B. This happens because of the epicardia to endocardia block 2 to 1 and alternance. But here it is much more. T is almost merging into the next P wave or in many beats. A lot of electrical instability. The importance is that once you identify this more than long QT, it is a medical emergency. Anytime this patient can have toxins. And this patient should be managed aggressively with the synthesis like a beta blockers, cardiac synthetic regeneration, correction of hyperkalemia, magnesium, hypermagnesium, you know. This patient had a cardiac arrhythmia calicate, and uh, they didn't identify that thing. And uh, later on, we had done a cardiac synthetic regeneration. So this is going to happen. Okay, next slide. Can I just ask, can you hear me? Yeah, yes, sir, please. Hi, John. Yes, hello. Did you have? I couldn't hear. Did you have the genetic diagnosis in the end? Yeah. Uh, uh, did you have genetic? Yeah, yeah. This patient, uh, we are doing a I, I mean, IGIB, that is ICMR sponsored genotyping of these cases now. We have 175 cases so far. I think this was a long QT one. If you have a long QT, uh, our patient had an auditory phenotype also. I think. Patient had renewed deafness on auditory evaluation. So this was oh, okay. two types of KC in E2 and KC in Q1 we see in these patients. They are heterocytous. We also have identified some compound heterocytous and by allelic mutation in these cases. I think it was a part of JLN that had an auditory phenotype as well. Okay, that's interesting because uh, I wondered whether with the PDA, whether the child might have had syndactyly and actually had Timothy syndrome. Timothy syndrome. Oh, Timothy syndrome. Okay. No, they did not have other phenotypic presentations of Timothy or Andrew. Okay. Thank you. Next, next. Very good. Thank you. So be with us again. Uh, next slide. Okay. So, 10 year old child with a recurrent giddiness. Do we have any clue for the giddiness options? So very good. So basically, you should not get confused whenever the ECG looks simple. It's simple also. So, uh, what's the site of the or origin of the ventricular complexes? Anyone? Are you? So, are you to tachycardia? One of the benign tachycardia seen without any structural disease. That is amenable for our population. So, here we have a bigeminal pattern. You do see a relatively narrow broad to your it's, it's broad, but slightly narrow. It is negative in V1, meaning it is an entity type, may is arising more to the right ventricle, and infill leads are positive. Okay, so we are able to meet this. Most of you are right. Next, we'll stop with the next one. Um, yeah, this is again. Uh, now we'll go for this. A 30 year old, already the answer was discussed in the previous slide. I mean, that was the slide. This is 30 year old adult patient with previous history of surgery done 10 years back comes with dizziness for the past three days. What's the diagnosis? Most of them are very irregularly irregular tachycardia, atrial fibrillation would be there in almost 99 percent cases. The other diagnosis with irregularly irregular tachycardias are uh, atrial tachycardia with variable conduction. But they are easier to diagnose because the variability is not too much, and then they behave like atrial fibrillation only. And uh, cases where you have multiple ectopic beads coming from various regions of atria, so uh, those are the ones which you see in the COATs. Yeah, multiple tachycardia. So can explain that you are. So why QRS is intermittently wider. getting widened? It is aberrancy. The bundle branches they have weird properties that their conduction property changes based on the previous uh, 
RR interval, and many a times when this phenomena happens, uh, the, one of the bundle branches will not conduct adequately, and a bundle branch block pattern can ensue, which is called as aberrance. So intermittent aberrancy is seen. These are not VTs. Uh, you can also look at the QRS morphology when the QRS become wide in the V1, and it is a classical RBBB pattern. So uh, unlikely to be a V. God usually does not give two serious problems at one time, so that also is the reason why answer B B is not correct. Yeah, one thing that so we have a lot of other easy short, short time there, so we will finish with this. So thank you very much for the active participation. Let us go for the results. Please. Yeah. So all of you please know the number, whatever you are carrying. We are going to do prices for the first three. Uh, yeah. Okay, so who is carrying number thirty-three? Just look at your number. Who is carrying number thirty-three? Who is carrying thirty-three? Oh, sorry, it's ninety-three. Who is ninety-three? Sir, you can. Who? <laughs> sir, is ninety-three. <93. laughs> So no, no, no. We are not going to give yeah. any gift we'll, to sir. We'll ask some money from him. Yeah, yeah. So, so sir is sponsoring the sponsoring session. The yeah. So, ninety-eight. Ninety-eight must be. Yeah, please come. That's Come, come. So, who is ninety? Sir, but this quiz was probably not meant for Sudeep sir. Yeah, but still, he asked me first. Sir, that is secondary, but yeah, he has. He is the winner. <laughs> okay, Sudeep. Two okay. so, places. Ninety-two. Ninety-two. Please come for it, sir. Come, come, come. He is a practicing electrophysiologist. Oh, <laughs> shall we give the prize to him or not? Then he is. He is going to chair the next session. Yes, okay. Okay. Then let us let us consider periodic cardiology. Yeah, okay. exactly. Okay. Then who is eighty-six? Who is eighty-six? Uh, perfect. Come, Doctor Bhavik. Eighty-three. Eighty-three. Yes, please. Come. Uh, what is your name? Abhishek. Okay, he is the perfect one. He is our target audience. Yeah. <laughs> because Dr. Bhavik is a practicing pediatric pediatric yeah. cardiologist. So we we'll reverse. He has got the first prize. So he has got the second prize, and he is getting the third prize. Yeah. Second so sir, prize. sir, I'll. Uh, so we are going to give the first prize to him. Right. Second or third, we don't know. <laughs> we may discuss later, but he is going to get the first prize. Okay. Thank you. Okay, thank congrats, Dr. Okay, Vishal. Right. Thank you. We'll go to the next session. Okay. Shukta, uh, you start. Yeah, may may I request Dr. Uh, Rakesh to chair the session, please? Sir, we have an online presentation first. Uh, welcome to the uh, pediatric arrhythmia and electrophysiology session. The first talk is Pediatric Arrhythmia Clinic of the Future by Professor Jonathan Skinner, who is a pediatric cardiologist and electrophysiologist at Auckland, New Zealand. These are the things that can cause sudden death, CCP, cardiac arrest in uh, children and youth. And we have the electrical type, we have the muscle types, and really arbitrarily uh, dividing those up into just the electrical ones for the E people and the uh, muscular ones for the uh, heart failure people really isn't how it goes because really what we're about doing here is trying to keep people alive. When I started back in 1998, um, I started my arrhythmia clinic in New Zealand and it's a weekly clinic and I saw mostly SVTs before and after ablation, the occasional pacemaker and uh, a little bit of syncope. I imagine you're swimming in in those cases in India. But in 2000, I had my first two patients who were referred to me after their death. That's um, a boy there called Ben, who was 11 when he died playing hockey. And Danielle was 18 months, uh, 21 months, when she um, died following a febrile convulsion. Um, she'd had a febrile convulsion just a couple of weeks before and then uh, died suddenly at home and the family came to see me and uh, wanted to know why this had happened now um 2000 this was just a few years after the, the three commonest genes for long qt syndrome had been discovered and, and in 2001 i wanted to try to start doing genetic testing and i teamed up with mark reese on the bottom there 
On the right is a molecular geneticist, John French at the top right, an adult cardiologist, and Jackie Crawford, a pacemaker tech cardiac physiologist. And we formed the Cardiac Inherited Disease Group. And there you see me with my son, George, who is now uh, 22 um, and um, particularly tall. Um, ben, we found by uh, sourcing DNA from his Guthrie card, had died uh, from long QT type one. And so this was the first time in the world that preserved DNA had found a cause of death um, related to channelopathies using the Guthrie card. And, and this was uh, in New Zealand, the Guthrie cards are stored uh, for many, many years. And so we started uh, sequencing those and people kept coming to my clinic and uh, sometimes three decades, uh, deaths from three decades previously, we were finding an answer and I managed to get um, some money we formed our little group there's our cidg four people in the group and we did a population-based study of sudden death getting together with the national forensic service and we did a molecular autopsy on all the unexplained deaths and combining that with investigating family members we found that 30 percent of one to 40 year olds had an inherited heart condition and so in 2008 new zealand was by far and away the first country in the world to have state funded the molecular autopsy and the forensic pathologist was sitting firmly within our cardiac inherited disease group. In 2010, a genetic counsellor joined full time onto our panel and we had regular multidisciplinary team meetings. We had regional coordinators now in 2012 from two other regions um, across New Zealand. And we had a clinical trainee who joined us, Catherine Waddell Smith. And while she was working with us, she helped move the cardiac inherited disease service actually into the hospital and by um, the regional coordinators being part of the inpatient management they started to detect um, inherited heart disease amongst adults who were sitting on the ward with their non-coronary disease their dilated cardiomyopathy or their syncope and by just taking a, a good family history we found we were able to raise the diagnostic rate of inherited conditions from eight percent up to 32 percent but getting back to our clinic, the nature of the cardiac genetic clinic in 2000 was basically a child who presented mostly with a symptom and there was one doctor who was me. Um, but in 2001, we now had two different clinics. We had John who was running his hypertrophic cardiomyopathy clinics and myself running syncope sudden death clinics coordinated by Jackie. By 2016, we had quite a team. Uh, of people running conjoint clinics. We had an adult cardiologist and myself in the same room and all of these people collaborating with this clinic. Then in 2019, I moved over from New Zealand to take up a position in Sydney. And I work now closely with Dr. Christian Turner, uh, who's uh, set up an inherited arrhythmia clinic. And this has come recently to uh, the public eye following our work, looking at the relationship of syncope to ventricular arrhythmia uh, and sudden death. In fact, we identified through an international collaborative study, 22 children who'd died suddenly or had a syncopal episode related to inherited heart conditions, mostly during video gaming, particularly um, uh, the war game type uh, games. But again, getting back to how we're going to model our clinics for now and for the future. If we're going to design an inherited arrhythmia service, you must first have an ethos, you must have a team and a plan. Our ethos is to detect, protect and enable, detect people with inherited heart conditions, protect them from sudden death and enable them to get back to their normal activities as far as is possible. You need to form a team and there they are and you need a plan. And our plan was a simple one. We had a central coordinator and if any practitioner from any walk of medicine felt that they had a patient who might have an inherited heart condition they simply had to refer to this one email address or this one phone number from anywhere in new zealand we designed an infrastructure with a registry database secretarial support and links to the university and through having these regular meetings with colleagues across the country we developed algorithmic protocols, for example, this one for the investigation of cardiac arrest once coronary artery disease or myocarditis had been excluded. And by developing this protocol and then people coming through that, going into a national registry, we soon started to find some inf interesting information about 
what is actually causing these cardiac arrests in the community when it's not due to coronary artery disease and it's not due to congenital or myocarditis in children. And you can see there that the majority were due to long QT syndrome. And the younger you were, the more likely you were to have a cardiomyopathy, and the older you were, the more likely it was to be a cardiomyopathy that's in the blue there. Interestingly, now as our clinic grows, uh, one of the things that's changing, uh, increasing our diagnostic rate is the use of imaging, particularly in people who have unexplained or difficult to explain cardiac arrest. This was a study from Boston, showed that MRI imaging uh, was essential in, in the investigation of VF in children and youth. So now in our 2018 team, we have an imaging specialist who's joined the team. What we've noticed by having this team active since the early 2000s, the nature of the presentations is changing. As we get better at screening families and identifying people in the community with long QT syndrome, we're protecting them. And we're seeing very few cardiac arrests now due to long QT syndrome. But CPVT is being presented more commonly as community resuscitation is getting more and more effective. When we looked at the recent 10 years in uh, Sydney, uh, those children that had survived a cardiac arrest and arrived in um, uh, pediatric intensive care, CPVT was the commonest, and then a list of rather rare causes. And this is what we're going to see, I think. Very little long QT syndrome in the future because we're good at screening it out. Um, and we're going to see more and more rare things, unique things, um, causing uh, VF sudden death. So we will be co-managing our patients with metabolic, endocrine, and other uh, genetic conditions with other different specialties. But where should this clinic be if we're looking to the future? Because, you know, hospitals are very frightening. You have grief to deal with, you have many investigations to do, and you have adult and pediatric cardiology specialists and also psychologists, and counselors, and so on. You have large families to meet and inform complex dynamics in the clinic, sometimes with some parts of the family necessarily. A typical outpatient clinic setting is not suitable. The ideal cardiac genetic clinic and the ideal inherited arrhythmia clinic would have many rooms. It wouldn't be too, too medicalized. You'd have plenty of time. Uh, you'd have a large room for family meetings. There'd be a play area for children, family friendly. You'd have well-organized, built-in flexibility with the team meeting up prior before the clinic. You'd have easy access to information about the whole family. Um, you'd have a coordinator bringing all these informations in together for our MDT before the clinic. You need to have a hub and spoke model of care with a center uh, guiding care, collaborating with regional cardiologists, geneticists, and other specialists. So it might look a bit like this, this sort of conglomeration of a play area, a meeting room, and comfortable areas to sit and deal with some difficult topics. Of course, you need a registry database, and it has to be a good one. Our one in New Zealand is a bespoke one with family drawing facility, and each of um, you can just click on each uh, family member and you bring up all the details. But there are uh, commercially available uh, systems that you can use. So what does the photo of an ideal clinic look like? Oh, well, it doesn't quite look like this, but this is really to show you uh, the kind of camaraderie uh, that is involved in this sort of thing. And in fact, this we're all gathered there um, at a local pub um, from uh, a family of uh, a young man who died suddenly. Uh, we tried our best to find the cause of death. We never did find the cause of death. Uh, but this pub, this brewery now raises money uh, for our cause. And it's a lovely annual event to go and um, celebrate this man's life and celebrate the money they're raising for us. It's quite an, an emotional thing to get involved with the investigation of sudden death. So there's our team. We're now identifying thousands of people um, with inherited heart conditions. And that's now. So what about in 2031? Well, now we're going to have gene therapies. We're going to have screening. I imagine that ECG screening will now have come of age. We'll have phenotype. Um, uh, people bringing their own phenotype with you might even bring in their own uh, genetic diagnosis with you. So it's really interesting. I mean, I think that if people will come into the clinic as they already are with the diagnosis of SVT from their Apple Watch. They'll come with their ECG phenotype. But the doctor, my phone says I've got long QT syndrome. We're going to see more and more of this. 
And now uh, we're seeing that Mike Ackerman's work in the Mayo Clinic at the simple cardia device there is able to detect long QT syndrome even more reliably than your average doctor. So patients can buy one of these, make their diagnosis and turn up at your door. And already in the States and across the world, you can order your own uh, genetic profile and these will become increasingly more detailed. Genetic health diseases can help you diagnose your disease. So patients are already coming to our clinic with their genotype and asking what it means. I'll give it to you straight. This disease is almost impossible to pronounce. So we're going to have to be really clued up and partnered with our genetic colleagues. It won't be doctors and mainstream medicine that leads the genotype phenotype development. It's going to be industry and the lay public because they want it. They're going to buy it. If it's commercially available, they will do. So at the moment, we have many ways that we can protect people once we diagnose their condition. ICDs, keyhole surgery, beta blockers, but new therapies are coming. We're going to have gene therapies. Long QT syndrome gene therapy is probably a decade away. CPVT is probably a little bit closer. So it's coming. All of these advances, um, more than 2,000 publications a year on gene therapy uh, in PubMed. So the future clinic will be defining which gene therapy is given to whom in our patients with inherited arrhythmias. And we're going to need to have these people in our registry so that when the therapy becomes available, we can give them a call and offer them this new uh, therapy. So 1998 in inherited arrhythmia clinics didn't exist. In 2008, they were still pretty rare. 2018, most large centers have one. 2028, family oriented inherited arrhythmia clinics are the norm. Most new patients are found through genetic and population screening and refer themselves from genetic tests and devices. And in 2038, well, maybe it's not relevant because planet Earth is no longer habitable, but if you're not a cynic like me, then perhaps gene therapies for acquired and inherited heart disease are commonplace and the cardiac genetic clinics manage the administration and follow up of these. But we'll only learn about what genes do if we study the phenotype properly and how genetic variants correlate with phenotype requires detail of both. And this can only be achieved by large scale clinical genetic registries. We've got more than 5,000 in our registry now in New Zealand. And the future meaningful progress of cardiac genetics will depend on multidisciplinary, translational, international, multi-ethnic, collaborative, consent-based cardiac genetic registries. Managed to get through that without a stutter, but that's what we have to aim for. But will genetic diagnosis and gene therapy be bought online like any other commodity? It's gonna be really hard to keep up. We don't know what's coming, but we're gonna to need to try to keep up so we can stop our patients going down the various dark holes that such therapy might open. Humans are losing themselves to technology. There's an old Maori uh, proverb which says, what is the most important thing in the world? It is the people, it is the people, it is the people. It's gonna be hard to keep up with the genetics. So let's hope we don't lose our humanity. Thanks very much for listening. It's been a real pleasure and I wish you all the best for the rest of your conference. Bye for now.